<laughs> Are you writing something? Gina. Oh, look at this. Hey, Bill. 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 That's very good. Could you write me something? An extension. Could you write me something? It has three prongs. Okay. You could plug into there and plug my. Could you write me something? Sure. Yeah, here she is. She's got it. She's bringing it. <laughs> That's very good. You're pretty good at that. Can I see the or you can do that here. Anyway. You see what I'm saying is plug it down there. Oh, this will work fine. Right. What are you going to do? Like that plant? Did you say do it All right. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good light. Everything. I remember green wood, and I couldn't find it on that letter. But I bought fifty eleven. So I just asked for the car. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Good for you. Every time we go downtown, we can order a quarter book. Does anybody mind if I sit here the whole week? Yeah, and you have to order it. Do you mind if I sit here? Look at the scholar. Look at the scholar. With the pen and the... Gina, you're... Yeah, I'm getting there. That's okay, I just let it go. Yeah. I zoom doesn't work as fast. Okay. In starting today, I think uh, it'd be appropriate to give a round of applause for our host and hostess. Huh? Yeah. For this lovely and gracious offer. <laughs> and for the people that brought up all this food and drinks. <laughs> now all we have to do is match it. Right. With an abundance of insight. Right. Good cheer. So uh, I want to thank Don and Nancy Flynn for offering their house. And so let me ask you to do something for a moment, all right? Can we pick up where we left off last Friday night? Last Friday night, we picked up the Alcibiades, and we went just through one page, didn't we? And all we did is say, is it possible to look at just one paragraph and see whether or not every illusion could be put into a framework of meaning? We had fun, and it looked like we could do, oh, nearly all, did we not? Had fun going back and forth and tying many things up together? Mm -hmm. Look here, if we can do it, therefore, with background data, I would suggest in the FADO, which is very little background data, we just take a look at the, the interrelationships that take place between Socrates' discourses and use that as a basis for structuring the work. Now, in the past, we've used myths. We played with the myth. Let's take that as given for a while and ask ourselves, where can we find formal closures to each one of the arguments in the dialogue and then Jalot just study the interaction between the participants, be between that ending and the next beginning of a formal argument. So like the inter... Uh, yeah. uh, so therefore, let's just take a look at the language and what's suggested and use that as a basis for structure. Look at the language of what I, I was... Missed it. Could you say it again? Between each argument, there's an interlude, which they are interactions, are they not, between the participants? Let's focus our energies there as a tool for understanding what's going to take place, both in the prior as well as the succeeding arguments. Is that interlude a transition from the one argument to the next, and in itself connect to a previous coming That's the that may be the yes, that's the assumption. Therefore, we can use it to structure, use that as a way of structuring the dialogue. 
So, now I'll mark a couple, you people mark a couple, all right, just to play for a moment. Mark a couple. Places. Places, yes. In the lobe, right at 70A, in the rouse, 472, Seventy-six. I'd count as the there parts of this one. What was the first one? Four seventy-two. And I believe it's seventy-two E. Okay. Seventy. Okay, 72E on page 481 to the third. Seven B, the third. What was the second here? Yeah, I'll go right to <coughs> Yeah, the first. I'll read the rouse first in order. Four seventy two, four seventy six, four eighty one. Corresponding in the low, seventy A, seventy two E, seventy seven B.
Next, 84C in the lobe, 489 for the next rows. Major division, So why don't we just do the first four? All right. There are five. To the first four. Right. You said four ninety two and four ninety three will be separate. Four ninety two, four ninety three is the major division in the text itself. That's where I'm cutting it for the for this evening. Oh, I see. I didn't All right. Pardon? Do you need a light? No, no, looks fine. That's 492, 493 is in the low here. That's 88D. 88D. That's the Beto Equities dialogue. You know there's a principle that before you do a lot of work, you should pause before doing so much, whether it may not be possible to give it to your neighbor. Pause. Make them work. So, uh, why don't we test it on 476, 72E in the low? We should find here, therefore, is a conclusion to a preceding discussion before launching off on another major section, an interlude. We want to see, therefore, what that interlude can reveal for us. <clears throat> Bracketing that would indicate the interlude. Uh, 
I put it right after the conclusion, where CBs agrees. Do you agree? Yes, CBs. I think this is all perfectly true. We are not deceived in admitting what we did, but in fact, coming to life again is really true. And living persons are born from the dead, and the souls of the dead exist. I think this is perfectly true. He comes to agree, does he not? I take that, therefore, as the end of a long discussion. And now the interlude begins. So we need a Cebes, a Simeus, and Sock. Who will play? Which one? Sock. Cebes, Simeus. All right? Do you want me to read out of the routes? Whichever is yours. Yes, CBs. I think this is all perfectly true. And we are not the Yes, keep that bottle. Keep that bottle. Yes. The room is taking your voice away. Oh, okay. Yes, CBs. I think this is all perfectly true, and we are not deceived in admitting what we did. But in fact, coming to life again is really true, and living persons are born from the dead, and the souls of the dead exist. Another thing, you know I didn't hear it. Yeah, it's hard to hear. Oh, my God. Another thing, you know that favorite argument of yours, Socrates, which we so often heard from you, that our learning is simply recollection. That also makes it necessary, I suppose, if it is true, that we learned at some form of time what we now remember. But this is impossible unless our soul existed somewhere before it was born in this human shape. In this way also the soul seems to be something immortal. But Phoebe, what are the proofs of this? Remind me, for I don't quite remember now. There is one very beautiful proof that people, when asked questions, if they are properly asked, say of themselves everything correctly. Yet if, they were, if there were not knowledge in them and right reason, they would not be able to do this. You see, if you show someone a diagram or anything like that, he proves most clearly that this is true. If you don't believe this, Simeus, look at it in another way and see whether you agree. You disbelieve, I take it, how what is called learning can be recollection? Disbelieve you? Not I. I just want to have an experience of what you are now discussing. Recollection. I almost remember, and I believe already from what Sibby has tried to say. Yet nonetheless, I should like to hear how you were going to put it. Okay, that's it. Great. That's the end of the interlude. Mm -hmm. Now, what can we claim from? That because we remember things, we have a power of recollection. And that's all learning is, is recollection. Yeah, back to the meaning. And where did we get it from? It must have been there from some other, before we were born. Would you agree then, CBs adds the doctrine of recollection at that point? Yes. He volunteers. Right. Simeus, 
further behind, for sure. What are the proofs of this? Remind me, because I can't remember, on the doctrine of recollection. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> A little bit of yoga. <laughs> CDs comes back. So that is a very beautiful proof. And he recalls very nicely that Mino episode, doesn't it? Socrates goes behind that, doesn't he? If you don't believe those things, look at it another way and see whether you agree. You 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 disbelieve, I take it. How what is called learning can be recollection? You oh, know, no, no, <laughs> not I. I don't disbelieve it. I want to have an experience of what we are now discussing. Recollection. <clears throat> oh, what does he want? He wants to know what that means to have doctrine. Or he wants to experience that, like you would to discuss being in love and having had that experience. Is that what that means? Yeah, more there, isn't it? I want to have an experience of what we are now discussing. Mm -hmm. Recollect. Fresh. Mm -hmm. Right now, right? And he's got Socrates, all right? You take me through it. Right? I want to receive it. I want to be, oh. I want to be drawn into it. I, I want to experience it. Mm -hmm. Right. Notice how he underlines that. I almost remember and believe already from what CDs tried to say. Right? I, I almost remember. Yet, nonetheless, I would like to hear how you were going to put it. Right? I want you to take me through it. I want to experience this doctrine of recollection. Right? Right. Would that be Pardon? Okay, go back therefore to see these remark. That people, when asked questions, if they are properly asked, say of themselves everything correctly. Right, weren't able to do it if they didn't have right reason within them. Simeus chuckles to himself and says, Oh, hey, I'd like to I'd like to have that. Now there's the man who can ask questions properly. He says, Oh, I remember, I, I remember. But hey, I want you to take me through it. Therefore, what becomes the next subject then? And he's going to take him through that experience. Right. He wants an experience, doesn't he? Right. Right. Maybe that's the first step in the practice of government. Are you, are you? I'm offering that as a possibility. Hmm. Could you speak up a little? All right. I'm offering that as first step in the practice of dying. Is what? Practice of dying. Is what? No, see, I thought you said dharma. <laughs> Maybe what is too. the first step that you're offering? <laughs> recollection. I'm not Doctor of recollection. The first step in the practice of dying. To recollect. If we follow the argument that yeah. we should have, we should, we should also be able to have that. Yeah. Only he's saying, no, no, he's saying, it probably has, it comes, it should come out of me. He wants it personal. Uh -huh. He sees it as oh, personal. Oh, I see. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, look here. Uh, does that suggest it was worthwhile? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, if so, then, go back, we're gonna go back and pick up the first one. All right, Barbara will do that one. <laughs> well, she practically volunteered, didn't she? Yep, right. practically. 
472 and Rouse 70A. From when Dr. Peter just finished? Yes. When Socrates had just finished, Cebes took up the word Socrates. On the whole, I think you speak well, but that about the soul is a thing which people find very hard to believe. They fear that when it parts from the body, it is nowhere anymore. But on the day when a man dies, as it parts from the body and goes out like a breath or a whiff of smoke, it is dispersed and flies away and is gone and is nowhere anymore. If it existed anywhere, gathered together by itself, if it existed anywhere, gathered together by itself, and rid of those evils which you have just described, there would be great and good hope, Socrates, that what you say is true. But this very thing needs no small reassurance and faith, faith that the soul exists when the man dies, and that it has some power and sense. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, quite true, quite true. I see it well. What are we to do? Shall we discuss this very question, whether such a thing is likely or not? For my part, I should very much like to know what your opinion of, is about it. I think no one has heard. I think no one who has heard us now could say, not even a composer of comedies, that I am babbling nonsense and talking about things I have nothing to do with. So, if you like. We must make a full inquiry. Let us inquire whether the souls of the dead of dead men really exist in the house of Hades or not. Well, there's a very there is the very ancient legend which we remember that they are continually arriving there from this world, and further that they come back here and are born again from the dead. If that is true, all right. Now that's the premise. And now comes the argument. And the so living I take the break there, but we can finish the paragraph. Go ahead. And the living are born again from the dead. Must not our souls exist there? For they could not be born again if they did not exist. And this would be sufficient proof that it is true. If it should be really shown that the living are born from the dead and from nowhere else. But if this be not true, we must take some other line. Okay. What do we get out of there? They're going to discuss if the living are born from the dead. And if that's true, well, then all the souls must live where the dead mm -hmm. are, and that's where they exist. Mm -hmm. Good one. Ancient legend of reincarnation. Yeah, okay. Now, that helps, you see. Uh, this next argument we can call the legend. Ken. The legend. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. The source of this argument is a legend. It's a different mm -hmm. also because the other was asking for an experience of a recollection and this appears at least on my seeing to be a request for a kind of reassurance. True. So it's, it's, uh, I think this is almost like a hypothetical. More so. Yes, because more so. he said if more. this is true, he doesn't say that this no. is really true. He says, let's set this up this way and let's see if this is true. And if not, we'll have to go somewhere else and figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't say that it's really, this is the way it is. No. This is just based on a story they heard. No, more. About the, what about the disbelief? The problem mm -hmm. That so a man is prone to disbelief. I mean, why believe one way or the other? And where CB says that men disbelieve that. That's right. But why believe? Why disbelieve it? Or why believe? You know, why should it? Why should there be more weight one way than another? No. Let me put it another way. Who owns the, the point you're raising behind it? Is who owns this argument? No. I mean, what's the who owns it? 
So what's the, many the, what's on the many. line, right? This is an argument from the many. Yeah. Right? It's not from them. Mm -hmm. Not personally said it's it. It's not personally from them, right? So this is the argument addressed from and to the many. Yeah, it's from the soul of man is prone to disbelief. So it's the soul of men, all you know, many. Yeah, okay. So, uh, what yeah. I get out of that apparently is, is that most of the people in this world don't live a good life, and so they go to Hades, and they have to be reborn again for whatever reason, because he said they're all from Hades. Well, that is if you believe well, that. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. That's not the same. Hell is not Hades. Oh. It's not the Christian. Okay. It's the world of the dead. Oh, okay. But it mess a variety of places. Okay, let's all go back do. over it. All right, Sean? Socrates, on the whole, I think you speak well. On the whole, I think you speak well. The general agreement. But about the soul, about the soul, is a thing which people find very hard to believe. They, when it parts from the body, there's nowhere anymore. They, people, and he characterizes it as the soul as much like smoke. And upon death it scatters, disperses itself, disperses into the air and flies away. Notice on the top of 473 and the end of that paragraph. If it existed anywhere, gathered together by itself, and rid of those evils which you have just described, there would be great and good hope, Socrates, that what you say is true. But this very thing needs no small reassurance and faith. And of course the word is faith. That the soul exists when the man dies. That needs, of course, it needs some power and sense. Socrates has answered, he wants reassurance. Quite true, quite true. What are we to do? Shall we discuss this very question? Whether such a thing is likely or not. What are we getting? Oh, a likely story. A likely, right? It's an argument to the many, and he's going to address it in terms of a likelihood. Therefore, he can fit it into a legend. Therefore, this argument is going to see whether this is likely or not. He would love to get a proof. Socrates says, I'll give you something likely. Give you something. A matter of fact, I, I uh, remember that legend? I'll base it on that. I find it curious that, that the way C.B. Uh, states that if it exists somewhere and gathered together by itself, rid of those evils, in, then he's referring back to Socrates' description, yes. that that will only give him a great and good hope. I yeah. mean, that it seems like that would it actually establish something more, more than he... No, he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand it. No. no. Well, they should give him more than just hope that what he says is true, is, I guess... Yeah, he can't understand. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly going to run there and find out why shortly. Good answer, question. What do they mean by the rid of these evils that you've described? That's why I got the impression that all these souls went to hell. <laughs> gave me that impression yeah. that they're referring to Hades as hell because they're all evil souls. Yeah, but that's not the case. So what is that referring to then? Okay. It's rid of these evils which you have just described. That's right. He thinks it's just been described. That's his opinion of the preceding argument. Um, this is the interlude. We think it goes back to preceding material and starts the next discussion. 
but it doesn't say anything by that sentence what was described before that might be of value for us? Yeah. What the soul is? Yes. Yeah, I think we're going to go into the material, into the oh, arguments. Oh, okay. I just thought we'd just look at the interludes for a moment. Okay. Okay. The Socrates puts it back on CPs and says, if you like, we must make a full inquiry. So, it's, even though it's an argument for the many, it's also CPs are for question. So he's not he's not saying that it's his. Socrates sees that it is his. Okay, 481. And the Rouse, 77B. Would you agree, I am quite convinced, said Simmons. 48, 481, and the Rouse. Set just seventy, just a couple of five lines or so above seventy seven A. Yeah. Socrates, it seems to me that there is absolutely the same certainty in our argument that comes to an excellent conclusion that our soul existed before we were born and that the essence of which you speak likewise exists. Do you agree that ends that? Mm -hmm. Then he turns, but how about Cebes? Okay. So Socrates turns <coughs> to Cebes. They're switching places, aren't they? Cebes answers to Okay, Socrates starts. Okay. And what thinks Cebes? We must convince Cebes too. It is a good it is good enough for him, as I believe. But he is the most obstinate man in the world at disbelieving what is said. However, I believe we really he really is convinced that our soul existed before our birth. Yet will it exist after death too? Yeah. I don't yet, oh, yet will it exist after yeah. death too? I don't think myself that has been proved yet, Socrates. We are confronted still with what CB said just now. Can it be that when the man dies, his soul is scattered abroad, and that is the end of it, as so many say? For supposing it is composed from somewhere or other, and comes into existence before, <coughs> before it even enters a human body, what hinders it when it has entered and finally got rid of that body from ending at that moment also? and being itself destroyed. Well said, Simeus. It does seem that half of what ought to be proved has been proved, that our soul exists before our birth. 
It must also be proved that when we die, it will exist no less than before our birth if the proof is to be completed. It has been proved already, my dear Simeus and Cebes, if you choose to combine this argument with what we agreed to before it, that all living comes from the dead. For if the soul exists before, and if it's necessary that when coming into life and being born, it comes from death and from nothing else at all, it must certainly be necessary that it exists even when one dies, since it must be born again. Well then, what you said has in fact been proved already. Still, I think you and Cebes would, would be glad to investigate this argument yet further. And you seem to me to have the fear which children have, that really, <coughs> When it leaves the body, the wind blows it away and scatters it, especially if anyone dies and not become weather, but in a great tempest. Then think we are afraid of that, Socrates, and try to convince us against it. Or better, don't think we are afraid, but imagine there is a kind of child in us which has such fears. <laughs> Then let us try to persuade this child not to fear death as if it were a bogey. No. You must sing incantations over it every day until you charm it out. My dear Socrates, where shall we get a good charmer of such things since you are leaving us? Alice is a big place, my dear CBs, and there are many good men in it, and there are many barbarian nations too, and you must search through them all, looking for such a charmer. You must spare neither money nor pain, since you could not spend money on anything more important. And you must not forget to search among yourselves, for perhaps you could not easily find any better able than yourselves to do that. Oh, that shall be done, of course. But let us go back to where we left off, if you would like to. But certainly I should like to. Of course I should. That's well said. Very well then. Okay. Now we start. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, what do we get from that interlude? Oh, we're con they're convinced about the soul's um, existence before death, and now they're concerned about what happens at death. And they're willing to say that it's the problem that they have, a fear that they have. Yeah. Well, no, that's the child within them. It's not really Close them. <laughs> I, I get the feel. They still won't. Is, is he, still won't. Are they taking ownership of it? Is there evidence they're taking ownership? Yeah. Yeah, there's some of evidence. Some right. So that picks up in the same way with what we found previously with Simmons. Yeah. Uh, he wants an experience that he wants to identify mm -hmm. that he wants to be taken through. More. All right. What else we got? Well, we do have that, I'm, I don't know about everybody, but I've had that experience that it would be a pity if I didn't go on living at the end. And that, that, that feeling there that, oh, what would happen if the soul just, that was it. But there's a reassuring feeling to know that you go on for eternity. And I think that's what they're trying to get at. That's what I feel. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm interpreting it too much, but it, that childlike fear is that worry that the whole thing will dissipate at the time we die, rather than go on for eternity. We have this idea of the charmer. More? Socrates sees that they have a fear which children have and the issue that they're bringing up uh, they fail to see that 
the argument has been proved earlier, which indicates that they, uh, because of that fear, they're not able to remember the prior argument and to see how it fits <coughs> and to hold it together. So it, it looks like the dynamics of, of the dialogue shows that um, that their fears are causing them to not be able to hold the themes together. Yes, yeah, you could say that. Uh, I don't think myself that has been proved yet, Socrates. He said. Socrates comes back and says, It has been proved already, my dear Sinners and Cities. All you have to do is combine the two arguments. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they're wanting Socrates to persuade them, mm -hmm. to persuade that child. Yeah. Right. And he's saying, you must sing incantation. Good. Let me ask you this then, staying on 482. Right? What does Socrates and these people mean by the incantation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the same the as the charm, charm, right? Until it is charmed out of it. That's what this Phaedo is. Mm -hmm. The arguments? Is that mean? The, the myths and the Phaedo and the... Yeah. Well, isn't that a type of prayer where they're praying... That, I don't know if they, they mean that the soul being like scattered by a tension or a storm that it's made of some kind of fragment, fragmentary material and that would break it into little pieces and it would be very painful to be not a united together as a one stuff, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fear of being dispersed. Yes. You know, and so it, the prayer is that we should stay together when, we're, when we die as a unit rather than still be fragmented. Okay, let me put it another way. Does it make any difference whether or not the translation reads incantation or a good singer of such charms? Put it another way. As we look at this interlude, does he define it? That's yeah, well, I was wondering if that well, you must see incantations over to charm or to get a child out. The back end he's talking about, since I can't remember what the charm is, we're wrecking my grandfather. Is he talking about reasoning it out? And that by seeing the incantations over it would be more reasoning it out. See, incantations is, can be regarded as a ritual. 
something that you repeat. And its specific content then takes the form of a repetition and therefore it's ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Good? But if someone were to say a good singer of charms, that's more flexible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Soothing. Uh, that's more flexible. It, it admits of a wider range, doesn't it? So, look, whichever one it is, consider both and keep reading. Let's go back. All right. All right. My dear Socrates, where shall we get a good charmer of such things since you're leaving us? Therefore, he's the charmer. He's the charmer. All right. Sock now must respond to that. He's just been called either a singer of charms or someone who recites incantations. Does he accept it or what does he do? With it? Okay, Socrates. It's, the palace is a big place, my dear Stevie, and there are many good men in it. There are many barbarian nations too. And you must search through them all looking for such a charmer. You must spare neither money nor pain since you could not spend on anything more important. You must not forget to search among yourselves. For perhaps you could not easily find any better able than yourself to do that. See this? Oh, well, that shall be done, of course. Come, let us go back to where we left off, if you would like to. Oh, but certainly I'd like to. Well, of course I should. Is uh, CB okay. saying right there, he's taking the focus now off of himself. Socrates is saying, search among yourselves. You may not find any better able than yourself. And CB says, oh sure, let's go back to, to something else. Mm -hmm. He's stuck before this then, mm -hmm. right? He's sending them on a search. Because he doesn't... Yeah, will he go back precisely to that point, the problem of scattering? Which was which was the content of the sphere, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the soul was like smoke. Which is what he wanted, yes, yes, like smoke. Which he wanted the charm for, or the incantation for. When he says that you should look into yourself, isn't that a reference to the doctrine of recollection? that they have it within them themselves already to recall? Yeah, you know, perhaps as well as know thyself, the whole Delphic Oracle. Mm -hmm. So then would you then agree at this point on then the major theme is going to be the scattering? He's going to now try to treat their fears? Call this... I mean, that's going to be the, the charm, charm to overcome scattering. That's right. Charm, charm to overcome scattering. At least one of those yeah. terms, the singing part, the singer of charms, is charms that heal, according to the lexicon. So they give, so it has a, that connotation rather than witchcraft, medicine. Well, yeah, that has absolutely, that's one of those remarks that Barbara makes that has absolutely <laughs> no value. <laughs> well, the reason why I brought it up was because of it. Right, absolutely no value. <laughs> Especially when you consider the end of the dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> right, it right? has absolutely nothing to do with the dialogue. No, there isn't any healing going on. There's no healing going on. <laughs> There's no use to offer that chicken. I mean, he's a singer. As one of Well, what are the implications, Berber? For a translator like yourself. Oh, it would be much more fun if it had been translated. You can't use incantation. You can't use incantation. Right? You'd have to. You'd have to communicate that it's it's Sing a charm, a healing charm. charm. Mm -hmm. Right. Then the reader could say, "Oh, we've been looking for some indication of healing in the dialogue, and here we have one." Right. Therefore, the disease would be 
fear. Mm -hmm. Special mm -hmm. kind of fear. Fear of de a death yeah. as understood in a certain way. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Right. Now when you die, the soul is like smoke and yeah. it disperses and it's gone. Forever. Right. That would be the particular... Yeah. Yeah. All right. Therefore, can we do the next one? 489? Mm -hmm. Did you say the low number? I didn't. 84C. 84C. There, 84C. Yeah, the low number is There was a long silence after Socrates had ended. Socrates himself was deep in these thoughts, or appeared to be, and so were most of us. Cedes and Simeas whispered together a bit. Socrates noticed them, he said, what's the matter? Surely you don't think our argument has missed anything. Indeed, there are a good many suspicions and objections if one is to go through it thoroughly. If then you're considering something else, I say nothing. But if you are at all puzzled about what we have been saying, don't hesitate to speak to yourselves. Go through it. See if you think it might have been improved. Take me with you through it again. If you think I can help you any more at all in your difficulty. Simmons? Well then, Socrates, I will tell you the truth. We have been puzzled for a long time, both of us, and each push pushes on the other and bids and asks, because we wish to hear and don't want to be a nuisance in case you were be feeling unhappy about the pleasant misfortune. Socrates laughed gently as he heard this and said, Oh, bless me, my dear Simeas. Surely I could hardly persuade others that I don't think the present fortune a misfortune when I can't persuade even you. But you fear I am more fretful now than I have been in my past life. Apparently it seems to you that I'm a worse prophet than the swans. And when they perceive that they must die, you know, they sing more and better than they ever did before, glad to be going away into the presence of that God whose servants they are. But men tell lies against them because they fear death themselves. And they say that the swans are mourning their death and singing a dirge for sorrow. 
Men don't take into account that no bird ever sings when it is hungry or cold or feels any other pain. Not the swallow, nor the hoopoe, or even the nightingale, which they say all sing a dirge for sorrow. But I don't believe those birds do sing in sorrow, nor do the swans. But these, I think, because they belong to Apollo, are prophets and know beforehand the good things in the other world and sing and rejoice on that day far more than ever before. Indeed, I think myself that I am the swan's fellow slave and sacred to the same God. And I think I have prophecy from my master no less than they have. And I depart from life no more dispirited than they do. No, as far as that matters, they're friends well now. You should you should speak and ask what you will. So long as we have leave of the Athenian board of eleven. Well, let me take a break. They can put the board up. As clues to divide up the work so we can take them as units. I think we should wait perhaps for uh, Ken and Patsy and Paul. Coffee's about? Yeah, I'm Thank you. 
Then, Socrates, I will tell you the truth. We have been puzzled for a long time, both of us, and each pushes on the other and bids him ask. Because we wish to hear and don't want to be a nuisance. All right. <clears throat> well then, Socrates, I will tell you the truth. We have been puzzled for a long time, both of us and each pushes on the other and bids him ask, because we wish to hear and don't want to be a nuisance, in case you are feeling unhappy about the present misfortune. Socrates laughed gently as he heard this and said, What? you got to say loud. Bless me, my dear Spivius. Surely I could hardly persuade others that I don't think the present fortune a misfortune. When I can't persuade even you but you fear I am more fretful now than I've ever been in my past life. Apparently, it seems to you that I'm, worse, I'm a worse prophet than the swans. When they perceive they must die, you know, they sing more and better than they ever did before. Glad to be going away in the presence of that God whose servant they, servants they are. But men tell lies against them because they fear death themselves and they say that the swans are mourning their death and singing a dirge for sorrow. Men don't take into account that no bird ever sings when it is cold or hungry or cold or feels any other pain, nor the swallow or the hoopoe or even the nightingale, which they say all sing a dirge for sorrow. But I don't believe those birds do sing in sorrow, nor do I, nor do the swans. So. But these, I think, because they belong to Apollo or prophets and be, know beforehand the good things in the other world and sing and rejoice on that day far more than they ever have ever before. Indeed, I think myself that I am the swan's fellow slave and sacred to the same God. And I think I have prophecy from my master no less than they have. And I depart from life, no more dispirited than they do. No, as far as that matters, you should speak and ask what you will, so long as we have leave of the Athenian Board of Eleven. Good. Then I... Good. Then I will speak out and tell you my difficulty in CV's 2, where he does not accept all you have said. For I think, as perhaps you do, Socrates, that to know the plain truth about such matters in this present life is impossible, or at least very difficult. <coughs> but only a very soft man would refuse to test in every possible way what is said about them, and would give, give up before examining them all over till he was tired out. I think a man's duty is one of two things, either to be taught or to find out where the truth is or if he cannot, at least to take the best possible human doctrine and the hardest to disprove, and to ride on this like a raft over the waters of life, and take the risk, unless he could have a more seaworthy vessel to carry him more safely and with less danger, some divine doctrine to bring him through. So now I will not be ashamed to ask, since you tell me yourself to do it, and I shall not blame myself afterwards because I did not say what I think. Well, my opinion is, Socrates, when I consider what has been said in my own mind and with Sibby's here, that it is not quite satisfactory. Perhaps, my comrade, your opinion is true, but say where it is not satisfactory. Here, that one could say the same about harmony, 
and a harp with strings, that the harmony is invisible and bodiless and all beautiful and divine on the tuned harp, but the harp itself and the strings are bodies and bodily and composite and earthy and akin to the mortal. So, when someone breaks the harp or cuts and bursts the strings, suppose he should maintain by the same argument as yours that it is necessary the harmony should still exist and not perish. For it would be just as impossible that the harp should still exist when the strings are broken. And the strings should still exist, which are of the mortal kind, as that of the harmony, as that the harmony should perish. Hmm. Harmony, which is of the same kith and kin as the divine and mortal, perishing before the mortal. No, he would say the harmony must necessarily exist somewhere and wood and string must rot away first before anything could happen to the harmony. Well, Socrates, I think you yourself have must have noticed that we conceive the soul to be something like this, that our body, being tuned and held together by hot and cold and dry and wet and such like, our soul is a kind of mixture and harmony of these very things when they are well and harmoniously mixed together. If then our soul is a kind of harmony, it is plain that when the body is slackened inharmoniously or too highly strung by disease and other evils, the soul must necessarily perish, although it is most divine. But as the other harmonies do, those in sounds and those in all the works of craftsmen, Oh, just as the other harmonies do, those in sounds and those in all the works of craftsmen. But the relics of each body will remain until it rots or is burnt. Then consider what we must answer to this argument if anyone claims that the soul is a mixture of the things in the body and at what is called death, it is the first, and at what is called death, it is the first to perish. Socrates gave and us with his eyes wide open, as he usually did, and said, smiling, What Simeon says is quite fair. Then, if any of you is readier than I am, why didn't he reply? I think he tackles the question neatly. But before the answer comes, I think we ought to hear Cephas first. What fault he has, too, has, what fault he too has to find with our argument. Then there will be a little time and we consider and consider what to say. Afterwards, when we have heard them, we ought to agree with them if they seem to be in tune with us. Or, if not, we should continue as before to defend our doctrine. Come on, CB, speak. What worried you? I'll tell you. I think the argument is where it was and has the same objection which I made before. That our soul existed before it came into this form, I do not retract. It was a nice, neat proof and quite satisfactory, if I may say so without offense. But that when we are dead, the soul will still exist somewhere. I can't say the same as that. However, I do not agree with the objection of Simeus that the soul is not stronger and much longer lasting than the body. For I think it is very far superior in all those respects. Well, the argument might say to me, why do you still disbelieve? You can see when a man is dead, the weaker part still existing, and don't you think the longer lasting must necessarily survive during his time? Well, see if you think anything of this answer of mine. Really, it seems that I also want a simile like Simeus. I think all this is very much the same as saying as follows of a weaver who died old. The man is not dead, but exists somewhere, safe and sound, and here is a proof one might offer. Here is the cloak which he wove himself and used to wear, safe and sound, and it has not perished. If someone disbelieved, one might ask him, which kind of thing is longer lasting? a man or a cloak in use and wear. If the answer was a man lasts longer than a cloak, one might imagine that this proved that the man was certainly safe and sound, 
since this short elastic thing had not perished. <clears throat> but I don't think that is right, Simeus. Just consider what I have to say now. Everyone would understand that such an argument is silly, for this weaver had woven and worn out many such cloaks and died later than all except the last when he died before it. Yet for all that a man is neither inferior to a cloak nor weaker. Soul and body might admit of the same simile, and one might fairly say the same about them, I think, that the soul is long-lasting, the body weaker and shorter-lasting. But one might say more, that each of the souls wears out many bodies, especially if it lives many years. For if the body wastes and perishes while the man still lives, but the soul always weaves anew what is worn away, it would, however, be necessary that when the soul perished, it would happen to be wearing the last body, and it would, be, it would perish before this last only. And when the soul perished, the body would show at once the nature of its weakness, and would quickly rot and vanish and decay. This argument, then, is not yet enough to give confidence that when we die, our soul exists somewhere. For if one should grant your supporter even more than what you say, and admitted to him not only that our souls existed in the time before our birth, but that nothing hindered the souls of some of us from still existing when we die and continuing to exist, and from being born and dying again and again, for so strong is its nature that the soul endures being born many times. One might admit that, and yet never admit that it does not suffer in these many birds, and at last in one of its deaths does not perish outward, outright. But one might say that no one knows which death and dissolution of the body brings death of the soul. For it is impossible for any one of us to distinguish it beforehand. Now if this is correct, it follows that anyone who is confident about death is foolish in his confidence, unless he can show that the soul is wholly immortal and imperishable. For if he cannot show this, it is necessary that he who is about to die must always fear for his soul, lest at the present separation from the body it may utterly perish. That's where we're cutting for a while, all right? Okay. So, does it do what we achieve? I mean, pardon me, does it achieve what we set up? Does it make the divisions? Does it look like at each point there's a conclusion and it becomes the material in the interlude for the next argument or the next exploration? Mm -hmm. All right, if that's the case now, right. let's go to the introduction and see whether that sets the stage. Now, there are two introductions, one for the whole and one for the, one for the sub part. So let's go to the introduction, right from the beginning. The expertise and a phaedo. Expertise, you'd like to plug? Oh, thank you. Phaedo? Need a phaedo? Thank you. Now, um, Equities, as you probably know, is a Pythagorean. And uh, watch the focus of his questions. They're very direct. He keeps going. He's too, he keeps probing and probing and probing until he gets what he wants. So be careful with those questions, and let's see what he's doing. First, let's read it through. Two pages. Do you Pardon, hear yourself fade on with Socrates on the day when he took the poison in prison? Or did you hear about it from someone? I would hear myself at the craze. And what was it our friend said before his death? How did he end? I should be glad to hear. You see, no one at all from our part of the world goes now to visit in Athens. And no visitor has come to us from there this long time. 
who might be able to tell us properly what happened. All they could say was, he took the poison and died. No one could tell us anything about the other details. Then you never heard how things went at the trial? Yes, somebody did bring news of that. We were surprised how long it seemed between the sentence and his death. Why was that, Fado? It was just a piece of luck, it's crazy. For the day before the trial, it so happened that the wreath was put on the piece of the ship which the Athenians sent to go. What ship is that? That is the ship, as the Athenians say, in which Theseus once went off to Crete to those twice seven, you know, and saved them and saved himself. The Athenians vowed to Apollo then, so it is said, that if the lives of these were saved, they would send a sacred mission every year to Delos. And they do send it still, every year, ever since that, to honor the gods. As soon as the mission has begun then, it is their law to keep the city pure during that time and to put no one to death before the ship arrives at Delos and comes back here again. This often takes some time when the winds happen to delay them. The beginning of the mission is when the priest of Apollo lays the roof, lays a wreath on the feet of the ship and this happened, as I say, the day before the trial. Accordingly, Socrates had a long time in prison between the trial and his death. Then what about the death itself, Phaedon? What was said or done? And which of his friends were with him? Or did the magistrates forbid their presence? And did he die alone with no friends there? Oh no, friends were with him, quite a number of them. That's just what I want to know. Please be so kind as to tell me all about it as clearly as possible, unless you happen to be busy. Oh, I have plenty of time. And I will try to tell you the whole story, indeed, to remember Socrates. And what he said himself, and what was said to him, is always the most precious thing in the world to me. Well, Phaedon, those who are going to hear you will feel the same. Pray to tell, pray, try to tell the whole story as exactly as you can. I must say I had the strangest feeling being there. I felt no pity, as one might, being present at the death of a dear friend. For the man seemed happy to me, at the praise, in bearing and in speech, how fearlessly and nobly he met the end. I could not help thinking that divine providence was with him, was with that man as he passed from this world to the next. And on coming there, also, it would be well with him, if ever with anyone that ever was. For this reason, I felt no pity at all, as one might at a scene of mourning. And yet, not the pleasure we used to have in our philosophic discussions. The conversation was certainly of that sort, but I really had an extraordinary feeling, a strange mixture of pleasure and pain at once. When I remembered that then and there, that man was to make his end, and all of us who were present were very much in the same state, sometimes laughing, sometimes shedding tears, and one of us particularly, Apollodorus, Oh, you know the man in his way. Oh, yes, of course. Well, he behaved quite as usual, and I was broken down myself, and so were others. But who were they to? Of our countrymen, there was this Apollodorus, kind of mentioned, and Topolus, and his father, besides Homogenes and Iphigenes <coughs> and Iphigenes and Anis, Antigas, Thenes, and there was also Stephos and Pay or Pyanon and the Nexus and other of our country ones, but Plato was ill, I think. Any 
Warner's present? Yes. Simeus, the heathen, and Thebes, and Thedombes, and Promagera, Euclides, and Terpsion. Oh, we're not Aristippos and Cleombrotos present? No, they were said to be in Aegina. Was anyone else there? I think these were about all who were present. Very well. Tell me, what did you talk about? <coughs> no? What do you say? Let's pull it out. say, ah, we can use that. Every one of those should be. Right. Or treated in some way. Well then, let's go to the second response. Pardon me, the second set of questions of equity, right? Then what did he say before his death? Pretty clear. Pretty clear. What is he what is he focusing on? Well, that moment when he's all right, what did he say before his death? Mm-hmm. Right up to the end. The transition. What did he say? That transition. Mm-hmm. How did he die? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. What does he want to know? The time, how come the time? Time spent, the gap. Once he finds out about that, what does he then do? What does he do right after that? He says, oh, I'll tell you why there was a ship, and he tells him the story of Jesus. Uh, how does Equites take the news, and what does he do with it? He wants to know immediately what about the death itself. And who was there? Who was there? What was, what was there again? Who was there? Or did he die alone? Four questions. What took place? Right. What was said and done? Which of his friends were with him? Huh. Who else can I go to that was the first hand witness in her collection? Yeah, yeah. Uh, be so good as to tell us as exactly as you can about all these things. Great deal of precision, isn't it? Well, that was after he got this information. gives him an account about his own state of mind. Also, also it's real impo- it's real it's the most precious thing in the world to Phaedo mm-hmm. and Epicrates says those three well, to remember Socrates, what he said, what was said to him, are is the most always the most important precious thing to Epicrates and I mean to Phaedo and Epicrates says that the people hearing him will feel the same. So what I was going to say was, then they have a personal issue, personal stake in what's going on 
much like simians and cities come to evidence at a certain point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, then uh, you will have here to feel that you do. Mm-hmm. Not here as you feel it. Tell us everything. And then he gets the list, doesn't he? Uh, let's pick up the list. And uh, what do we get? How many people were mentioned there? <coughs> yeah. One. Um, Pretobulus. Two. And his father. No name. Creo. Yes, it's not there. Yeah. No, it's Creo and his father. And his, his father. His father's not mentioned. His father's name isn't there. It's in two. They put it in. Read it, though. What is the last? It says that the name is Apollodorus, and his father Creo was present. Yeah, he put it in. Now, go ahead. Homogenes. Back. Hippogonies. Ascanes, Anthosthenes, Cepheus, Nexmus. This Plato will build the things. Uh, what if it turns out that we get 13 plus theta? What? Twice seven. Look here. Can we say as Socrates is to the 14 around him in the jail? So, Theseus is to the 14 on his journey to Crete. back to that section in the beginning. Uh, Barbara, can you do that, that is the ship? Yeah. It was just a piece of luck at Pocratus, for the day before the trial, it so happened that the reef was put on the poop of a ship which the Athenians sent to Delos. What ship is that? That is the ship, as the Athenians say, in which Theseus once went off to Crete with those twice seven, you know, and saved them and saved himself. Two things. Saved himself. Saved the fourteen. And then returned, as we all know, to the quality of the Then returns and becomes king. So now, there's a custom that 14 are sent to the island not of Crete, but to Delos. During that time, no capital punishment is allowed. It's a sacred mission, too. A sacred mission. To honor the God. Is there any analogy intended? No, it's just <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Try it again. Let's 
pull the whole thing out. All right, let it extend it. If Theseus, the hero, went with the 14 to slay the Minotaur, and returns saving the 14 gains gains the throne alright the basic map you can say you might even gotten help from Adrienne if you want to add details to it alright then, if this if this is being referenced, then Socrates, to be a philosophical hero, must journey with the fourteen to slay something like the Minotaur. some labyrinthian material rock to find and discover the minotaur and slay the minotaur and then return. If that's right, we could put all those details in this. What's essential, what's essential in the story, of course, is that only Theseus knows that he went down into the labyrinth and only he has personal experience of slaying the Minotaur. Only he. If so, then on a similar basis, only Socrates, as a philosophical hero, can then have be said to slay something analogous to the Minotaur and only he would have personal knowledge of it. The 14 would not. Therefore, he has to save them in a different way than he himself would save. They are going to be sacrificed because, obviously, the only thing he can do for them is save them from the fear of the Minotaur. He can't slay them, save them from the Minotaur. All right, therefore, the 14 have to be saved of their fear. Therefore, extending, all right? Therefore, our Socratic hero must then journey with the 14, a philosophical journey, to slay their fear of yeah. death. Their fear of death, not death, and return, saving the 14, because then they will be able to overcome their fears, and he gains, as it were, a throne by going down through the labyrinth alone, finding the source of the Minotaur and so on. And now obviously that would have to be something on the philosophical right. side. He defeats death himself. Has to defeat death himself. So look at if that's the case, let's go here to our first division, 70. Right? 70A, 472. That's the silence. Uh, there's one thing I, I wouldn't understand. Um, he went down the labyrinth. Where did Socrates go? And, uh, to go where did he go? We'll have to find that in that in that section. Oh, I, I We're just sketching it out. I didn't hear it. No, no, we didn't say. Oh, okay. The labyrinth of arguments. Okay, <laughs> labyrinth of arguments. Uh, All right. What can we pick up from the following, all right? Is the dialogue over at uh, 70A or 472? 
as far as Socrates is concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's, he's given his art, well argued, well argued. I was in convincing when I painted in Jeff. This is my defense. It's over. Mm -hmm. So right. he's concluded his defense. And what does he have to deal with? That's when the fear comes in. That's where the fear comes in. So far as I could. That's, that's where the fear comes There are two levels of the fear, aren't there? There are the fear projected on the many, and when Socrates does away with that, then they have to come out with their own theories, don't they? So there's two levels. Right. Level one is when they talk about the many, and Socrates does that on two levels, doesn't he? You can say the first level is when he takes that argument of the many and shows it to be weak. Then each, Cebes and Simeus each come back with objections, and Socrates therefore has to come back and take care of each of their objections to the many. Good. That's done, is it not? That's right. done. And now what do they have to do? Take their own. The they argument. now have to take their own, which then becomes the basis for the second half of the dialogue. Now that they can't hold behind that, they can't stand behind that, now they have to get to the fact that they have a fear of that. They really have something else. They really, they really believe something else to be the case. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, that's why we're going to stop it right there. And we'll take that later because each one of these involve a different myth and therefore there are five myths in the dialogue. It's controlled by five myths. And uh, this is... Well, each, one, each state has a myth, is not it? Well, that could be, but uh, the Theseus myth is a controlling one. Therefore, at the section that we are soon to get to, at the conclusion, we can see it very clearly at the conclusion of Simeus's argument, if you go to uh, 88, 88 here, 499, 95A about, A or B. Harmonia. Yeah. He just finishes with the argument of harmonia, of harmony, mm -hmm. and now he makes the reference that would give us the basis for our myth. He says, look here, he says, a Theban harmonia has been appeased, it seems, pretty well. But what of Cadmus, our dear CBs? How shall we appease Cadmus? What argument? So he has harmonia. <clears throat> Atmos, Apollo, right. and we had Apollo just a short while ago, did we not? Remember? We make that, he says, I'm a prophet just like uh, uh, the swan. As a matter of fact, I'm a prophet in the same camp as, as Apollo. And that's in 489. And the fifth one, I'll hold back. Well, I like the whole thing. <coughs> Give a potato chip for the person who can fill that in. Five years? That's because he's a son of a god, like Hercules. Well, wow. Hyperboreans are in there. Well, we could put we could put Hercules. We could put the, the uh, demigods too. Hercules, etc. But I, I want to say one. Boy, if it's if it's hierarchical. Dionysius. 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 
So, look at You see, let's see what we can do with this. If we can take if we can take this as a controlling myth, then we can say then if, if Socrates does in fact slay this minotaur, whatever it is, then he's the only one who knows it. They wouldn't. And therefore we should be able to see that they don't understand a certain part of this dialogue, the part that we are going to say is, is, is the combat with the minotaur. They cannot in principle understand it because they weren't there in terms of the myth. Right. And therefore there's no way in which they could comprehend it since they weren't there. Now, to play with that, I would say we go from beginning of the dialogue to here. That's the slaying of the minister. When he says he did all he could do? To where to where? Right to 78. Yeah. 78. Yeah. That's the Let's go back there and look at the silence and let's see. We're going to assert that if you take a look at what they're saying, it will indicate that they don't understand what took place because if they did, they would never have their question. Socrates does not straighten them out. All right, he doesn't go through it. He recognizes they don't understand it. And he takes them, therefore, on the level of their fears. Would you not agree we can have fun with a Theseus myth and say the Theseus went down to the land to slay the Minotaur and he came back up? There is no argument. There's no way he could convince them that he slew the Minotaur. So all he could do would be dealing with their fears. Come on, boys, let's get back on the boat. I'll tell you about how I brought them or something else like that. I'll give you a likely story or something. I'll have to overcome your fears. But I'm the only one who knows whether or not the monster was slain. So, too, the philosophical <coughs> heroes in a similar, similar analogous state. What kind of fears would they have if he came up and said, let's go, boys, I've slain the Minotaur? Well, they might say, how do we know that you were down there sleeping for a half an hour? Well, what would they care? They'd have to go back the next year. They'd have to go back the next year. Well, they wouldn't be whatever they were. They'd be in the same 14 back. They come back. Uh, I think they'd be in trouble with the, the city. The authorities, too. Right. Yeah. Because not only that, he was just, yes, coming back if successful, of course, he would raise a black flag, et cetera. I mean, a black set. And, yeah, would black if they failed, white if they won. And therefore, so he would gain the kingdom if he won. Therefore, essential. Okay. All right, shall we try it now? Here's the idea now. We're going to look at the idea of death. The idea of death is going to have several levels. Right? There's going to be a key one, a philosophical death. With once we get, we're going to equate that with a minotaur. We're going to say that that's a philosophical dime, that's unique, that's not going to be understood by most people, and that's certainly not going to be understood by the 14. All right, good? Mm. Therefore, what's the most important question you can ask right now, Barbara? Where do we start? What time is it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Let's get some sleep and start this early in the morning. Now, we've got a big question, guys. We're running over time. Let's no, go. Bad principle. All right. Okay, now, we're going to get a series of understandings of the idea of death. We're going to get a definition of it. It's going to go through a variety of, of uh, alternate ways of explaining it until we find the land on the philosophical one. The philosophical one will be the one that they don't understand. We'll be able to see that when we return to their responses at 78. Okay? All right. Yeah, remember, you guys are working overtime. No kidding. Bad precedent. Mark is going to go, right? Good thing Rob is in here. Yeah. Why? Well, we've already given him some, some idea of his perspective. Wait at the right time. Begin, begin at the wrong time. So where, where do we start? Well, I, uh, I would say the introduction proceeds until evidence. Or I like to pronounce it evidence, it's wrong. Uenos, isn't it? Uenos? Oh. C-U-E-N-O-S. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I'd say the introduction, the second introduction, picks up, all right, and Socrates makes the reflections about him and anything. So right, that's picks page. it up at 464, yeah. and 61 C and D, and below. Uh, did that start 61 days. Yeah. What advice Socrates he said to give to him? Then tell you and us that. See, reason, bid him farewell. Tell him to follow me as soon as he can. It, it, it's sensible. I'm going away as it seems today. Or so the Athenians command. What advice Socrates to give to you and us? I have often met the man from what I have seen of him. So far, so, so far he will be the last man to obey. Why? Is he not a philosopher? Sure. Then, certainly, he'll be willing enough. And so will everyone who goes properly into this subject. That's the beginning. Everyone will be willing to die if we properly go into the subject. Now that's the that's the claim. All right, that's death. If we properly understand it, we should all be willing to die. Okay, that's the beginning. Okay, so now we need the Cities, the Socrates. Use the same ones we had. All right. Now we're going to go eight pages, all right? Okay. Then Eunice will be willing enough. Then Eunice will be willing enough, and so will everyone who goes properly into the subject. But perhaps he will not do violence to himself, for they say that it is not lawful. What do you mean, Socrates, by saying that it is not lawful for a man to do violence to himself, but that the philosopher would be willing to follow the dying? Oh, why, Cebes, have... Not you and Simeus heard all about such things from Philolaos when you were his pupils? Nothing clear, Socrates. Well, truly, all I say myself is only from hearsay. However, what I happen to hear, I don't mind telling you. Indeed, it is perhaps most proper that one who is going to depart and take up his abode in that world should think about the life over there and say, what sort of life will we imagine it to be? For what else could one do with the time till sunset? Well then, why pray do they say it is not lawful for a man to take his own life, my dear Socrates? I have already heard Philolaos myself, as you asked me just now, when he was staying in our parts, and I have heard others too. <coughs> And they all said, we must not do that. But I never heard anything clear about it. Well, go on trying, and perhaps you may hear something. It might perhaps seem surprising to you if in this one thing of all that happens to a human being, there is never any exception. If it never chances to a man amongst the other chances of his life, that sometimes for some people it is better to die than to live. But it does probably seem surprising to you if those two people for whom it is better to die may not rightly do this for themselves, to themselves, but, but must wait for some other benefactor. True for me by Zeus. <laughs> Indeed, put it like put put like this. It would seem unreasonable, but possibly there is a grain of reason in it. At least the tale whispered in secret about these things is that we men are in sort of custody, 
and a man must not release himself or run away, which appears a great mystery to me and not easy to see through. But I do think, Stevies, it is right to say the gods are those who take care of us and that we men are one of the gods' possessions. Don't you think so? Yes, I do. Then, if one of your own possessions, your slave, should kill himself without your indicating to him that you wanted him to die, you would be angry with him and punish him if there was any punishment. Certainly. Possibly, then. It is not unreasonable in that sense that a man must not kill himself before God sends on him some necessity. Like that which is present here now. Yes, indeed, that seems likely. But you said just now, Socrates, that philosophers ought cheerfully to be willing to die. That does seem unreasonable, at least if there is reason in what they have just said. That God is he who cares for us, and we are his possessions. That the wisest men should not object to depart out of this service in which we are overseen. By the best overseers there are, gods, there is no reason in that. For I don't suppose a wise man thinks he will care better for himself when he is free. But a foolish man might well believe that he should run away from an owner, and he would not remember that from a good one he ought not to run away, but to stay as long as he could. And so he would thoughtlessly run away, while the man of sense would desire always to be with one better than himself. Indeed, in this case, Socrates, the opposite of what was said would be likely. It is proper that wise men should object to die and foolish men should be glad. Oh, see, this is always on the hunt for arguments and won't believe me straight off whatever one says. But I, but I tell you, Socrates, I think now, I think I now see something in what C.B. says myself. For what could men want, if they are truly wise, in running away from owners better than themselves, and lightly shaking them off? And I really think Seabees is um, aiming his argument at you, because you take it so easily to leave both of us and good masters, as you admit yourself, gods. Quite right. I think I must answer this before you, just as, as if you were in court. Exactly. Very well. I will try to convince you better than I did my judges. I believe, my dear Simeus and Cebus, that I shall pass over first to all, first of all, to other gods, both wise and good. Secondly, to dead men, better than those in this world. And if I did not think so, I should do, do wrong in not objecting to death. But believing this, be assured that I hope I shall find myself in the company of good men although I would not maintain it for certain, but that I shall pass over to God who are very good masters, be assured that if I would maintain for certain anything else of the kind, I would with certainty maintain this. Then for these reasons, so far from objecting, I have good <coughs> hopes that something remains for the dead, as has been the belief from time immemorial and something much better for the good than for the bad. <clears throat> then do you mean to keep this idea to yourself and go away with it, or will you give us a share? This good find seems to be a case of findings. This good find seems to be a case of findings is sharings between us. And don't forget you are on your defense to see if you can convince us. Well, I'll try. But... Let's see. Well, first, I see Creton here has been wanting to say something ever so long. Let's ask what it is. It'd be Creton. Only this. The man who's to give you the poison mm -hmm. keeps telling me to advise you not to talk too much. He says people get hotter by talking, and nothing like that ought to accompany the poison. Otherwise, people who do, to do that, often have to take two or three potions. Oh, let him be. He must be just ready to give me two or three if necessary. I guess as much, but he keeps bothering me. Oh, let him be. Now then, I want to give the proof at once to you as my judges why I think it is likely that one who has spent his life in philosophy should be confident when he is going to die 
and have good hopes that he will win the greatest blessings in the next world when he is ended. So Simeus and Cebes be my judges. I will try to show how this could be true. <coughs> I assume that this is Socrates still mm-hmm. speaking. Yeah. The fact is, those who tackle philosophy aright are simply and solely practicing dying, practicing death, all the time. But nobody sees it. If this is true, then it would surely be unreasonable that they should earnestly do this and nothing else all of their lives. Yet when death comes, they should object to what they've been so long earnestly practicing. (laughs) I don't feel like laughing just now, Socrates, but you have made me laugh. I think the many, if they heard that what you, that would, if they heard that would say, that's a good one for the philosophers, and other people in my city would heartily agree that philosophers are really suffering from a wish to die, and now they have found them out, that they richly deserve it. Now, this paragraph, keep in your head, all right, indelible, right. This is it, right? That would be true, Simeus, except the word found out, for they have not found out in what sense the real philosophers wish to die and deserve to die and what kind of death it is. Let us say goodbye to them and ask ourselves, do we think there is such a thing as death? Okay, now, go back, right? For they, the many, have not found out in what sense the real philosophers wish to die. One, in what sense that's meant. All right, in what sense they deserve to die and what kind of death it is. It admits of a plurality. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, now he begins exploring the notion of death. Remember, the kind. All right, that can in what sense real philosophers wish to die, deserve to die, and what kind of death it is. So we're going to get a variety of multiplicity on it. Okay, go ahead. Certainly. That's a great one. Again, <laughs> certain <laughs> is anything more than the separation of the soul from the body is it anything more than the separation of the soul from the body death is that the body separates from the soul and remains by itself apart from the soul and the soul separated from the body exists by itself apart from the body is death anything but that no, that is what death is. Okay, that's the general. Okay, then any kind must fit inside. <clears throat> then consider, my good friend, if you agree with me here, for I think this is the best way to understand the question we are examining. Do you think it is the part of a philosopher to be earnestly concerned with what we are calling pleasures, such as these, eating and drinking, for example? Not at all. The pleasures of love, then? Oh no. Well, what do you suppose a man that regards the other bodily indulgences as precious, getting fine clothes and shoes and other bodily adornments, ought he to price them high or low? Beyond what share of them is it absolutely necessary to have? Low, I think, if he is a true philosopher. Then, in general, do you think that such a man's concern is not for the body? But as far as he can, he stands aloof from that and turns towards the soul? I do. Then firstly, is it is not clear that in such things the philosopher, as much as possible, sets free the soul from communion with the body more than other men? So it appears. Is that a kind of death? Yeah. Separation of soul from body. Not body from soul. No, he says free. Free, more than separate. He said separate before, but now it's free the soul from the body. Yes. The soul from the body. See, though it was body from soul, he's making a distinction. He sets free the soul from communion with the body. Okay. Right, okay. Now, 
And I suppose to me, as it must seem to most men, that he who has no pleasure in such things and takes no share in them does not deserve to live. But he is getting pretty close to death, but he does not care about pleasures which he has by means of the body. Mm, quite true. Well then, what about the actual getting of wisdom? Is the body in the way or not? If a man takes it with him as a companion in the search, I mean, for example, is there any truth for men in their sight and hearing? Or as poets are forever dinning in our ears, do we hear nothing and see nothing exactly? Right. Yet if these things, if these of our bodily senses are not exact and clear, the others will hardly be, for they are all inferior to these. Don't you think so? Mm, certainly. Then, when the soul... When does the soul get hold of the truth? For whenever the soul tries to examine anything in the company, in company with the body, it is plain that it is deceived by it. Quite true. Then is it not clear that in reasoning, if anywhere, something of the realities become visible to it? Yes. And I suppose it reasons best when none of these senses disturbs it, hearing, or sight, or pain, or pleasure indeed, but when it is completely by itself and says goodbye to the body, and so far as possible has no dealings with it, when it reaches out and grasps that which it really is. That is true. And is it not then that the philosopher's soul chiefly holds the body cheap and escapes from it while it seeks to be by itself? So it seems. Let us pass on, Simon. Do we say that there is such a thing as justice by itself or not? We do say so, certainly. Such a thing as the good and the beautiful? Of course. And did you ever see one of them with your eyes? Never. By any other sense of those, the body has... Did you ever grasp them? I mean all such things, greatness, health, strength, and sure, and everything that, you, that really is the nature of things, whatever they are. Is it through the body that the real truth is perceived, or is this better? Whoever of us prepares himself most completely and most exactly to comprehend each thing which he examines would come nearest to knowing each one. Certainly. And would he do that most purely who should appreciate each with his intelligence alone, not adding sight to the intelligence or dragging in any other sense along with reasoning, but using the intelligence uncontaminated alone by itself while he tries to hunt out each essence uncontaminated, keeping clear of, his, of eyes and ears and one might say of the whole body because he thinks the body disturbs him and hinders the soul from getting possession of truth and wisdom when body and soul are companions, is not this the man, Simeus, of anyone who <coughs> hit reality? Nothing could be more true. Then, from all this, genuine philosophers must come to see such opinion as follows, such as to make one another statements such as these. A sort of direct path, so to speak, seems to take us to the conclusion that so long as we have the body with us in our inquiry and our soul is mixed up with so great an evil, we shall never attain sufficiently what we desire. And that, we say, is the truth. For the body provides thousands of busy distractions because of necessity, necessary food. Besides, if diseases fall upon us, they hinder us from the pursuit of the real. With loves and desires and fears and all kinds of fancy and much, much rubbish, it infects us and really and truly makes us, as they say, unable to think one little bit about anything at all at a time. Indeed, wars and factions and battles all come from the body and its desires and from nothing else. For the desire of getting wealth causes all wars and we're compelled to desire wealth by the body. 
being slaves to the, its culture. Therefore, we have no leisure for philosophy from all these reasons. Chief of all is that if we do have some leisure and turn away from the body to speculate on something, in our searches it is everywhere interfering. It causes confusion and disturbance and dazzles us so that it will not let us see the truth. So in fact, we see that if we are ever to know anything purely, we must get rid of it and examine the real things by the soul alone. And then it seems, after we are dead, as the reasoning shows, not while we live, we shall possess that which we desire, lovers of what we say we are, namely wisdom. For it is impossible in company with the body to know anything purely. One thing of two follows. Either knowledge is possible nowhere, or only after death. For then alone the soul will be quite by itself apart from the body, but not before. And while we are alive, we shall be nearest to knowing, as it seems as far as possible. We have no commerce or communion with the body, which it is not absolutely necessary. And if we're not infected with its nature, but keep ourselves sure of it, until God himself sets us free. And so, pure and rid of the body's foolishness, we shall probably be in the company of those by ourselves, and shall know to ourselves complete incontamination, and that is perhaps the truth. For, but, but for the impure to grasp the pure is not, it seems, allowed. So we must thank Simeus. And so we must say to one another, all who are rightly lovers of learning, don't you agree? Yes. Then Socrates, and then to Socrates, if this is true, my comrade, there is great hope that when I arrive where I am traveling, there, if anywhere, I shall sufficiently possess that for which all our study has been pursued in this past life. So the journey which is commanded for me is made with good hope and the same for any other man who believes he has got his mind purified, that I may call it. Certainly. And is not purification really that which has been mentioned so often in our discussion, to separate as far as possible the soul from the body and to accustom it to collect itself together out of the body in every part and to dwell alone by itself as far as it can, both at this present and in the future, being free from the body as if from a prison? By all means. Then is not this called death, a freeing and separation of soul from the body? Hmm, not a doubt of that. But the set of free, as we say, is the chief endeavor of those who rightly love wisdom. <laughs> Nay, of those alone. And the very care and practice of philosophers is nothing but the freeing and separation of soul from body, don't you think so? Mm, it appears to be so. Then, as I said at first, it would be absurd for a man preparing himself in his life to be as near as possible to death, so to live, and then when death came to object. Mm -hmm, of course. Then back to me is those who rightly love wisdom are practicing dying and death to them is the least terrible thing in the world. Look at it this way. If they're everywhere at enmity with the body and desire the soul to be alone by itself, and if when this very thing happens, they shall fear and object, would not that be wholly unreasonable? Should they not willingly go to a place where there's good hope of finding what they were in love with all through life, and they love wisdom, and of ridding themselves of the companion which they hated? When human favorites and wives and sons have died, many have been willing to go down to the grave, drawn by the hope of seeing there those they used to desire and of being with them. But one who is really in love with wisdom and holds firm to the same hope, that he will find it in the grave and nowhere else worth speaking of. Will he then fret of dying and not so little rejoicing. We must surely think, my comrade, that he will go, re go rejoicing. If he is really a philosopher, he will surely believe that he will find wisdom in its pure.
purity there and there alone. If this is true, would it not be most unreasonable, as I've just said now, if such a one feared death? Unreasonable, I do declare. Then this is proof enough. And if you see a man fretting because he's going to die, he was not really a philosopher, but a philosoma, a wisdom lover. Not a wisdom lover, but a body lover. And no doubt the same man is a money lover, an honors lover, one or both. Mm, it certainly is so, as you say. Then Simeon, does not what we call carriage belong specifically to persons so disposed as philosophers are? Mm, I have no doubt of it. And the same with temperance? With the many called temperance? Not to be agitated about desires? but to hold them lightly and decently? Does not this belong to those alone who hold the body lightly and live in philosophy? Mm, that must be so. You see, if you will consider the courage and temperance of others, you will think it strange. How so? You know that everyone else thinks death one of the greatest evils Indeed, I do. Then is it not fear of greater evils which makes the brave endure death when they do? Mm, that's true. Then fear and fearing makes all men brave except philosophers. Yet it's unreasonable to become brave by fear and cowardice. Mm. Yes. And what of the decent men? Are they not in the same case? A sort of intemperance makes them temperate? Although we say such a thing is impossible, nevertheless, with that self-complacent temperance, they are in a similar case, because they fear to be deprived of other pleasures, and because they desire them, they abstain from some, because they are mastered by others. They say, of course, intemperance is to be ruled by pleasures. Yet what happens to them is to master some pleasures and to be mastered by others. And this is much the, the same as what was said just now, that in a way, intemperance has made them temperate. Mm, so it seems. Bless you, Simeus. This is hardly an honest deal in virtue, to trade pleasure for pleasure and pain for pain and fear for fear, and even greater for less, as if they were current coin. No, the only honest currency for which all of these must be traded is wisdom. And all the things are in truth to be brought with this and sold for this. And courage and temperance and justice, and in short, true virtue depend on wisdom whether pleasure and fear and all other such things are added or taken away. But when they are deprived of wisdom and exchanged one for another, virtue of that kind is no more than a make-believe, a thing of reality, slavish, and having no help for truth in it. And truth is in reality a cleansing from all such things. And temperance and justice and courage and wisdom itself are a means of purification. Indeed, it seems those who establish our mystic rites were no fools. They, in truth, spoke with a hidden meaning long ago when they said that whoever is uninitiated and unconsecrated when he comes to the house of Hades will lie in mud but the purified and consecrated when he goes there will dwell with God. Indeed, as they say in the rites, many are called, but are try to were chosen. Try to put them. When one bears are many, inspired mystics are few. You want the table? Mm -hmm. The thirstless bearers numerous are seen, but few the Bacchuses have always been. Yeah, it's Bacchus in Greek, <coughs> and that's Dionysius. Mm. 
And these few are, in my opinion, no other than those who have loved wisdom in the right way. One of these I've tried to be by every effort in my life, and I have left nothing undone according to my ability. If I have endeavored in the right way, if we have succeeded at all, we shall know clearly when we get there, very soon, if God wills, I think. There is my defense before you gentlemen on the bench, Simeus and Tibis, showing that in leaving you, my masters here, I am reasonable and not fretting of being upset, because I believe that I shall find there good masters and good comrades. So if I am more convincing to you in my defense than I was to the Athenian judges, I should be satisfied. Okay, let's go to 67D. And it's not a purification, really, that which has been mentioned so often in our discussion. And it's been mentioned so often in our discussion. Right, now, what process is involved and how can we sketch it out? To separate, as far as possible, the soul from the body. To accustom it, to collect itself, together, out of the body in every part, and to dwell alone by itself as far as it can, both at this present and in the future, being freed from the body as if from a prison. Right? That's a process, isn't it? That's a yoga. Mm -hmm. That's a classic yoga. It's a habit. It's a collection. You have to accustom it. It's, right? Notice that. Look at the load. As separated as far as possible the soul from the body, teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body and living as far as it can, both now and hereafter, alone by itself, freeing the body as well as others. Then this, then, is not this called death, the freeing and the separation of the soul from the body? But to set it free, as we say, is the chief endeavor of those who rightly love wisdom. Nay, of those alone, the very care and practice of the philosophers is nothing but the freeing and the separation of the soul from the body. Don't you think so? Well, a man has been preparing himself for this whole thing his whole life. All right, isn't it natural that if he's getting close to it, he'll jump at the chance to do it? Well, then those who rightly love wisdom are practicing dying. Look here, they're practicing dying. And death to them is the least terrible thing in the world. And when this happens, of course they're not going to fear it's a process. Is that what it is? Is that a yoga? Right. Okay, back to 472. Socrates had finished. Cebes took it up. Let's see if he grasps that. All right, Cebes? Socrates, on the whole, I think you speak well. But that, part, that about the soul is a thing which people find very hard to believe. They fear that when it parts from the body, it is nowhere anymore. But on the day when a man dies, as it parts from the body and goes out like a breath or a whiff of smoke, it is dispersed and flies away and is gone and is nowhere anymore. If it existed anywhere, gathered together by itself, and rid of these evils which you have just described, it would be great and good hope, Socrates, that what you say is true. But this very thing needs no small reassurance in faith that the soul exists when a man dies and that it is some power in the sense. My dear Cedars, 
Haven't we made this sufficiently clear to you? The only way you're going to get the proper reassurance is to forget being convinced and persuaded, to try to separate your soul from the body yourself and see whether it's mm. possible and what the soul therein would experience. Mm. For unless you do that, all arguments about its possibility are purely unnecessary right? and redundant. Is that the way your translation goes? Good. I don't think it's that straightforward, is it? <laughs> right? What, does, does CB's understand? Right? He picks up the, the right words. Does he understand? He's one of the 14. Right? He's saying one of the 14. He, he hasn't seen that slaying of death. So now Socrates has to deal, not with, he can't deal with death. They don't know what death is. Therefore, he has to deal with the fear of death. And that, in a comparable way, would be like the 14th sphere of the Minotaur. Right. Huh? And right after this, it says, let's take a break. Mm -hmm. Or play well, some yeah. words. <laughs> Let me make an announcement. Yeah, a couple. Uh, I had asked everyone to give me $25 and also the receipts for their checks for those who can pay. If you would do that, then I can divvy out how much. Yeah. Except for those who have scholarships. Yeah. Okay, any other announcements?